Open your Bibles now, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew. We're in chapter number 27, and our text verses for today are verses number 45 through 50. And the message is entitled, What Happened While Jesus was on the cross. What happened while Jesus was on the cross? Matthew chapter number 27, beginning with verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, they said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway, One of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded. Up the ghost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the preciousness of the word of God. Thank you for dying on the cross of Calvary for sinners like us. Thank you for all the things that happened while you were on the cross. And Lord, the cross and what you did for us on Calvary is certainly the answer, the main answer to all the ills that trouble society. God, I don't want to be remiss to thank you for those that may be watching uh, uh, via the online ministry, our social media. And Father, I pray for them, I pray for all of us, that you'd keep us safe and from harm. Our our parents, our children, our grandparents, our friends. Lord, keep us safe. God, help every aspect of society to work together, to navigate together in a wonderful Christian manner to get to the end of this uh, virus threat. We pray that you would help us. Help me to preach today. Lord, I'm in uh, unusual waters this morning. I need your help. Uh, If there's anyone that isn't saved, God help them get saved. Thank you for the wonderful testimony that uh, Brian has given this morning. His salvation, his obedience to you in the waters of baptism. And Lord, may all of those today that fearfully look on, we pray that they would see in his act of obedience uh, that which they need in their own lives also. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our text for today, A supernatural darkness has come over all the land. From the Bible said the sixth hour unto the ninth. It seems that Jesus was nailed to the cross approximately nine o'clock in the morning. The rabble around the cross uh, continued acting out their feelings until noon 
And then God sent this supernatural darkness over all the land. Uh, You can imagine uh, that there were changes in people's attitudes around Calvary's that day, can't you? And and their actions had changed. And I, I imagine only the vilest of sinners remained in their obstinate uh, uh, attitude and continued their mockery and their reviling. It's, it's likely that it was this sudden supernatural darkness that caused one of those thieves crucified on either side of Jesus to realize his real need and to repent of sin and get saved. About the ninth hour after three hours on the cross, Darkness. Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some around the cross thought he was calling for Elijah, the Old Testament prophet. Uh, someone got a sponge soaked with vinegar, put it on the end of a of a long stick, and lifted it up to the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this was done. The vinegar was mixed with a drug. And and this was done to dull the senses of those that suffered such fates as this. But others said, don't do that. Leave him alone. I want to see if this dead prophet he's talking about will really come and and rescue him. And it wasn't. It seemed but uh, moments that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost. Now, here's my uh, guiding thoughts for the message today. First of all, there's the, the darkness that comes over all the land. Secondly, there's a despairing cry from the lips of our Lord. And lastly, the death of Christ on the cross itself. Think about the darkness that came over the land. The Bible said from the sixth hour there was darkness over all until the ninth hour. In the ancient Jewish times, uh, the first hour began with the breaking of day. And uh, the the, uh, sixth hour would be noon when the sun would be at what we would say its brightest. And, but God darkens the sky. It seems that Jesus was put on that cross about 9 o'clock in the morning, the third hour of the day. Now, here's what I want you to see. This means that from the time of his arrest in the garden, the night before, 
that he had already experienced several long hours of suffering beyond our ability to describe. It began with him being pulled around and and pushed around, slandered, mocked, lied on, beaten, uh, uh, with a whip that cut to the very bone all the way through the skin and the the muscle and the, the sinew. He was robed in royalty for the laughter of the rabble. A crown of thorns had been pressed upon his brow. He had been stripped again and robed again with his own clothes and forced to carry his own cross up Calvary's road. And then he had been forced to lie upon the cross and feel the nails driven through his hands. And his feet. And and hung up on the cross. And now he's already hung up on the cross for, for three hours. Before this supernatural darkness comes. Here's what I want you to see. This darkness was... A supernatural darkness sent from God. And uh, it wasn't just a local phenomenon. Perhaps you've read uh, uh, that the skies became overcast or, or it got somewhat uh, darkened. And it was just a, a local phenomenon. Look, the Bible said over all the land. Now, if you looked at Luke, Luke's record of this, it it, it makes it so plain for everyone to understand. In Luke 23 and verse 44, the Bible said it was over all the earth. Over all the earth. Now, imagine that. God sent. A supernatural darkness over all the earth. It had to be over all the earth. Do you know why? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, you see, God... Loved the whole world. And what he's doing on the cross of Calvary is a demonstration of his love for the whole world. And and, and what God is doing on behalf of humanity, he's doing uh, in behalf of all the world. And, And therefore, the supernatural darkness was over all the world. You know, uh, I'm just thinking, what was their reaction to the darkness? It was mixed. Some, like the, the thief, realized his spiritual condition, his, his need of God, and, and he repents and he gets right. But some, Continue on their careless, sinful ways. Their mockings and their revilings continue. You know, I, I, I was just thinking, we're in the midst of a crisis in America. And not only in America, 
throughout the whole world, it seems, or the whole world will eventually be affected if it's not uh, uh, taken care of quickly. And I understand that Italy is suffering horribly because of this. The uh, contagion is affecting thousands of people here in the United States. And, and I think as of yesterday, the death rate was up to 267 or, or beyond. I'm just wondering. You know, I, I'm not prepared to say, and I would not say, I do not know whether God sent this or not. I I don't think that God sent it per se. But you know as well as I do, our God is sovereign and God had to allow it or it wouldn't have come. So I guess my question is, when God allows a darkness, when God allows something that's beyond our control, beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension, why is this happening? When when God allows something like that to happen, what is going to be our response? You know, sometimes people repent. Sometimes people don't repent. I thought of those in the tribulation time, obstinate in their sin. In Revelation 9, 20 and 21, uh, God, during the coming tribulation, will send a darkness akin to what he sent on the land, on, on Calvary. And the Bible tells us that people still won't repent. It does. In Revelation 16, 11, uh, listen, uh, during, during, uh, uh, excuse me, in in Revelation 9, God said a sickness. Uh, Please let me correct that. And, And people still wouldn't repent. But in Revelation 16, he said a darkness. And they still wouldn't repent. It's my prayer that this crisis we're facing, this sickness we're facing, this darkness we're facing, that we will come to know the Lord, that people will come to know the Lord. I'm praying that people will even call and say, Pastor, I've got to get saved. There's a despairing cry from the lips of our Lord. Look at the text. After uh, six long hours of indescribable suffering on the cross, of which the last three were in darkness, moments before dying, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why? Hast thou forsaken me? It's one of what's known as the seven last sayings of the Lord from the cross. And I don't know if there was just seven. There could have been eight. Depends on how you uh, look at the things that he said. Could have been more, less. But in Luke. 23 and 34 from the cross Jesus cried and said Father forgive them they know not what they do what love what compassion die on the cross suffering unspeakable anguish for me and he says Father forgive them they know not what they do Luke 23 and 43, to that repentant thief, today uh, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That man had sinned all of his life away, and his lifestyle had caused him to have the death penalty imposed. 
and, and moments before dying on the cross, Jesus forgave you his sin. Isn't that wonderful? The compassion of our Lord for sinners. John 19 and 26. Woman, behold thy son. Because his mother stuck with her son just as long as she could. And to the disciple, <laughs> you're, behold, your mother. I want you to treat my mother like you'd treat your mother. Oh, how compassionate and wonderful our Lord is. In John 19 and 28. I thirst. He cried from the cross. And if you want to know why he cried from the cross, I thirst. Luke 16 tells us about a man who died in his sin and went to hell. And from the the fires of hell. He said, Sin, Lazarus, he might dip his finger in water and then place it upon my tongue that it might cool my, my tongue. Listen, Jesus, thirsty for every man that thirsts. So they won't have to thirst. Matthew 27. 46, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The despairing cry from the cross, John 19, 30, it is finished. Luke 21, 46, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So, I want you to focus just for a moment on this despairing cry. My God. My God. You know, he refers to his father. But here, he refers to him as as God. In the context of being forsaken, he says, my God. My God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Despair means to have a loss of hope, an absence of hope. And here's what we learn. Jesus is experiencing the fate of all who die unsaved. Their God, the God that made them, Forsakes them. Hell, you see, is a is a place where God isn't. It's a place of the total absence of God and the total absence of, of anything good that comes from God. Jesus is saying the words that every man and woman that dies and go into hell will say. Oh, he's taking our place. I hope you don't mind my weeping this morning. I I can't I can't hardly get around Calvary. And keep my cheeks unmoistened with tears when I think about what my Lord did for me. You see, 
Those in hell cannot reach God. Though they want to. Now, I don't want to scare anyone, but actually the Bible teaches us that sometimes, even before people die in a state of consciousness, they have walked on the grace of God and rejected God so long that they call and God's nowhere to be found. <laughs> Why hast thou forsaken me? And then finally, there's the death of Christ on the cross. Look at the text once more. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, cried out from the cross as loudly as he could, yielded up the ghost. He cried out, It is finished, Father. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Christ's suffering on the cross ended there. But indulge me for just a few more moments. The full payment of our sins did not. Let me show you something that you will either believe in or some dispute. Our Lord not only bore our sins in his body on the tree, our Lord carried all of the sins of the world, all of my sins, on the shoulders of his soul into hell itself and deposited them there and walked into a place called Paradise and liberated the Old Testament saints and, and ascended with them on high. That's what the Bible said. But you want a verse? Let me give it to you. Isaiah 53, verses number 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Verse number 11, he shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. See, audience, what I want you to understand is Jesus did more for you than die on the cross. He went to hell for you. He went to hell for you. What is hell? All of us will agree it's the payment for sin. Those that will not let Jesus pay for their sins, they pay for their sins themselves. In the outer darkness of, of hell, eternal, Jesus paid that debt full that we might be free. Let me give you one more passage in the book of Acts, chapter number 2. I want you to see something. I want you to more than see something. I want you to get something. You see, you don't have to, to go into hell because Jesus loved you so much. And he went into hell for you. Acts 2 and 31. He seen, therefore, the old prophet, 
uh, spake of the resurrection of Christ. Now here's what I want you to see. That his soul was not left in hell. Neither did his flesh. Did it see corruption? You see, both the flesh, the body of our Lord, bore our sins on the tree. And his soul, the shoulders of his soul, bore them into the regions of hell that we don't ever have to go there. Isn't that wonderful? How can you not come to Christ after such a wonderful, wonderful display of his love? Let me close the message today. And folks, if you're listening to the old preacher online, I don't know anything about the that stuff and I might not have the best of manners or I might not be as eloquent as as you'd like for me to be but you got my heart you see you got my heart and my question is this will you accept the death and the resurrection of Christ for the salvation of your soul. Or will you walk away from Calvary untouched? Untouched. Stand. Here's your opportunity, and I hope you're still listening. Right where you're at, if you've never trusted Christ and you see you need the Lord, please just bow your head, get down on your knees, and ask God. Say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm lost. Be merciful to me. Save my soul. I trust completely. In the Lord Jesus Christ. And receive him. As my savior. If you'll do that. In honesty. In sincerity. God. Won't turn you away. He'll take you in. And you'll be his child. Forever. Heaven will be your home. Because of what happened. On Calvary.